I'm going to open the planning board meeting at uh, 5.02 and hand it over to Keith. Okay. Um, well, I might as well, the, the, the hearing notice is short, so I might as well read it. Um, notice is hereby given that in accordance with Chapter 87, Section 3, and Chapter 40, Section 15C, the joint public hearing will be held by the tree warden and the planning board on Tuesday, March 30th, 2021 at 5 p.m. in Waitley, Mass. For the purpose of the removal of the following trees. Three, North Street. And this is where I've made a change because I've met with the homeowner, the landowners. Originally, there was going to be a 16 inch hemlock, a 12 inch spruce, an 18 inch spruce, a 12 inch hemlock and a 30 inch spruce. After meeting with the landowners, um, now it is only going to be an 18 inch spruce and a 12 inch hemlock. And they are agreeable to that. And then the next location, seven North Street, which is again, the Quan Quan property. There is a 32 inch maple and a 34 inch maple. 15 North Street, which is on the Sweetsters property, there's a 32 inch maple. 206 Chestnut Plain Road, a 30 inch maple on the property of Regina Labello. 208 Chestnut Plain Road, a 14 inch maple on the Nickerson property. 185 Chestnut Plain Road, 18 inch maple, a 20 inch maple. Becky Jones is the landowner. And then the last site is Christian Lane along in front of the police station, between the police station and the road. There's 11 12 inch spruces. And that is everything that was on my list. And I guess I also will say that Barry Croak from Eversource is, is attending the meeting in case anybody had any questions from Eversource about this. Um, Northern Tree Company is the contractor that Eversource has hired to do the work. And so I guess I'll open it up to questions. Is Eversource the instigator here? Yes, we are. <laughs> so this is this is for property line for line maintenance basically or, or um, line security. Yeah, reliability improvement. It's more than our normal tree trimming. We are just trying to improve reliability. So again, further elaborate, all of the residents I have contacted and talked to every one of them. And the only, obviously I didn't talk to the, about the police station, but the police chief has no issue. And in regards to the trees were, were originally planted as an order of condition with the cell tower being built However, one of the things that wasn't really looked at was the fact that they were planted under the power lines. Um, we went back, I had Brian and Amy at the town office research the order of conditions. And the only thing that came up in the order of conditions was that the contractor or the owner of the tower be responsible for maintaining them for one year until such time so they didn't you know die from from being like lack of watering or something of that nature so other than that there's nothing that we could determine sarah will there be any water runoff or undermining of the foundation of the police station issues in the future because trees keep a lot of water no. okay good i don't it was never put it this way in all the years prior to that building has been there since the early 70s, mid 70s, and there was never any issue. Okay, thank you. Because that would be an unfortunate result. Is there any plan to replace any of the trees along the scenic road? Or to do any kind of replacement planning, presumably not in precisely there, the same location? Yeah, certainly what I would say is, you know, the, the reason these are being cut is they're in the within the 15 foot buffer zone of the utility wires. So um, while something could be planted, again, it's it's probably not, I would not recommend it. Maybe, uh, maybe they could be pushed back a little bit. I don't know without inspecting the other trees 
maybe we could push it back a little bit to plant something young. Uh, I, I would be willing to put in a couple of trees, but in a totally different location because looking at the embankment by the police station, that's something where if we put trees in, they're probably just going to get overtaken by the native species brush and such. They'll come up. Yeah, I was uh, thinking the scenic roads are North Street and Chestnut Plain. Um, and tree cover is a fairly important part of, of the character of those roads, I guess. Mm -hmm. Keith, is there a program in the town for not necessarily a, a one for one for this particular event, but planting in general to pick spots along the scenic roads to plant to where there is opportunity to plant trees? Yes, we we have money available every year. That we when we can we per purchase new trees and and replant trees where we can. And in the last few years. Well, at least the last 10 years, we've done a lot of elm trees, the ones that have been, um, for the most part, they have held up pretty good. However, we've lost a few of them to, that still get Dutch elm disease. But um, the reason I like the elms is that they're um, res residuant to the salts and the, you know, the calciums and the chlorides, whereas the maple trees are very susceptible. Um, another one that is very good is oak trees, but a don't like oaks on their front yard. Um, so, you know, we work with a homeowner and landowners and try to plant something that's agreeable. Are all of these cuts going to just leave stumps all over the place? The stumps that, you know, in these cases, they're all, these are all in the town's layout. We will grind the stumps up. The town will do that. Most of the trees we're doing are kind of in decline, like the maples along uh, Chestnut Plain. His north or Chestnut, Chestnut Plain, I guess, right in the center of town. Uh, those are declining. The one, the only ones that we would be removing. Uh, we don't. You know, we're not removing a lot of healthy trees. The ones by the police station, they are healthy, but it wouldn't be a good place to put anything back. But I, like I was saying, I wouldn't mind putting a couple of trees in a location that are away from the wires, if you have some spot around town buildings or something, but putting them back under the wires, that would be kind of counterproductive. Mm -hmm. The other so thing we, in regards- We would have that conversation through, through Keith? Yes. Yep, I can do that. The other thing that I also wanted to comment about this was the, as far as Quan Quan goes, um, They've done a lot in the, with all of their trees on their frontage through the years, working with C.L. Frank, which is now Bartlett Tree. Um, and they've done an awful lot to preserve them and maintain them on their own. And I have met with C.L. Frank because I know that Anne, you know, relies on them for their expertise. And even they agreed that the, there's nothing more that they could do for the, the maple trees. You know, they're just, um, they've reached their age and they need to come down. So Keith, is it your recommendation as tree warden that all of these trees come down and that in your view, they don't, um, the removal of these trees doesn't impact the scenic character of the two scenic roads in question? I'm recommending that, you know, they, they come down for the main factor. They've gotten to the point where they're a hazard, especially the one, the maples on North Street. Um, and not only, not only a hazard to, to the traveling public or anybody that might be walking, but all the, all the affected residents that when they lose power are whatever they might be doing at the time when the power goes out, if this can prevent it, well, then that's, you know, and again, we're not cutting trees that are that don't have a deficiency <clears throat> per se, other than those the ones that at three North Street, which was the three the the spruce and the hemlock. Those two were were, were not diseased, but they're very close to the wires, and and that's why Anne agreed to let those two go. However, the other ones are being left are left alone. Okay. Okay.
I think you've talked to all the, all the property owners, Keith. Yes, I have. And, you know, even like um, Rebecca Jones, she has asked me to have them, had them taken down a year ago and we just never got around to it ourselves. And now Eversource is looking at the same issue, so. Anybody uh, from the public have any more questions? Um, I make a motion that the planning board recommend that the trees come down as listed. I'll second that. Okay, we're gonna have a roll call. Sarah? Yes. Don, yes. Brent? Yes. Tom? Yes. Uh, the motion passes. Yeah. Hey, what about Judy? Oh, Judy, you're, she's hiding on me. <laughs> Judy, what do you yeah. think? Yes. Uh, I've got too, too many things open on my screen. You were covered up. All right. Did 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 I hear Branton there? Yes. Okay, thank you. It was unanimous. Um, Keith, do you don't have All anything right. else? I have nothing more in regards to the tree hearing, so we can close that and move on to your next item agenda. Thank you, Barry, for attending. And I'll, I'll stick around to discuss things a little bit more in regards to the, um, see what Tony has to offer in regards to the Hannum property. Well, thank you. Thank you to thank everyone you. for hearing this. And uh, I'll talk to you sometime soon, Keith, about planting something. Arbor Day is coming. Maybe that'd be a good time. So, all right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Uh, it's seven or five thirteen. I, do you think we should wait two more minutes to uh, reopen the public hearing, or to continue the public hearing? I think everybody that's going to show up is here. I'm going to continue with public hearing to discuss approval of common driveway on the Hannum property, parcel eighteen, lot nine, Masterson Road. ANR is not going to be considered this time. Is that correct, Tony? That is correct. And I don't know what's going on with my camera tonight, so you'll just have to listen to me on uh, uh, voice. But um, um, thank I you. Can bring, I can bring up the drawings if need be. Yeah. Um, so um, I just want to thank you all for your patience. Um, we we um, got to start by just giving you a little update on, on where we were um, from last time we met. Um, as you know, we were um, we continue to work with the state natural heritage and endangered species program um, regarding the property, um, and um, so that's the reason why I'm not going to ask for the ANR to be heard until we get our conservation management permit, just in case a line has to move. And I, I don't want to bother the board with coming back with amendment and amendment. So if we could um, um, sit on that, that would be great. Um, uh, Don, if you could go to um, page four, which would be sheet three of the drawings. Um, I'll just show you a little um, brief discussion on where we're at as far as the lotting and that. Hey, is that the page you want, Tony? No, you'll have to go back. Um, go back. Uh, I you have to open the, the uh, other object. Yeah, you'll have to open up the set I sent you yesterday. I believe the sheet is the same, but it's not the one I want to go. That'll be the second exhibit that I go to. Okay. So sheet four. Um, okay, there you go. Thank you. Okay, uh, that was one, three. This yeah, is one back. Go back one. There you go. 
Okay, so this is the current um, mapping or lotting, which if we were had our conservation management permit, this is what the ANR plan would look like. Um, so you know that the, the property in question is 91.2 acres. And um, when we originally submitted, we had three lots. We had um, uh, two fr uh, frontage lot and the two back lots. Um, uh, the zoning board, as we went through their process, um, um, informed us that we could only do one flag lot, not two. Um, and so we revised the plan to show uh, two residential lots, we removed the frontage lot. And so we have a flag lot, number one, and then a residential lot, number two, meeting the zoning. Um, you know, we're in aquifer protection, so these lots have to be over three acres. So um, enough of that. Uh, the main reason we're here is to get a, obtain a special permit for the common drive. The common drive has not changed uh, in alignment or anything from our original submittal. Um, it's still, as we, we have, it crosses uh, the lots um, through the frontage. And um, the reason why we've placed that common drive there is because from an environmental standpoint, it's, it's, it's the pinch point between the two wetland areas. We have bordering vegetated wetland to the north and an isolated wetland to the south which was probably created because the, the farm road and access through there was filled over the years and um, the wetlands don't connect. So when we construct this um, um, common drive, it would be placed within a 40 foot uh, common drive easement. And the reason why it's wider is because we'll have electric poles that'll go up in there um, to allow um, power to power the residents. So we make them extra wide so that there's no question that the, the, those utilities can get up there. It'll be on-site wells and, and on-site septic. So um, the only thing that we would have is communications and power. Uh, we will be constructing culverts and head walls to limit the amount of wetland disturbance there to allow flow. And over time, this the, the isolated wetland will now become a boarding vegetated wetland because we'll have the connectivity with the culverts. Um, the common drive meets the standard design criteria in the town bylaw. It's, um, it provides for a turnaround at the end for emergency vehicles and sanitary trucks. Uh, it's a, it's a kind of a hammerhead or a wide turnaround at the end. Um, the, uh, Common drive is 16 foot wide and we have two foot shoulders on either side. Um, the minimum is 15 foot in the bylaw. The maximum grade uh, is 12%. And you'll notice at the lower end on this sheet, the profile that the maximum that we have within the common drive area is 7.9%. So we meet that um, requirement. Um, we will have um, three lots served by this common drive, the two residential lots, and we can provide access to the back land here. Um, so, um, um, you know, that meets the requirements of no more than four lots in the town bylaw. Uh, we submitted um, an, a, a draft of the covenant for maintenance uh, in this position, those two residential lots would share maintenance of that um, common driveway. Um, uh, you know, the, there are a few things like um, that we would have you put into the special permit as conditions, you know, that the common driveway will not be uh, extended to serve additional lots, that the special permit would state that the common driveway is not a private road or a public road, and therefore cannot be accepted um, by town uh, uh, because it doesn't meet road standards. And if it ever was, it would have to be brought up to road standards. Um, that's uh, item number two in section 171-11, um, uh, except three uses where common driveway uh, uh, regulations are, are contained. Um, I... I think that's Tony, really Tony. the most important things that I wanted to state. Um, and I guess I'll take any questions that the board has. Tony, yeah? the bylaw says that uh, 
no land held in common ownership with lots served by a common driveway at the time the lots were created shall be subsequently subdivided. Does that take care of your? Yes, first? I think I think that would be a condition if you wanted to add that just as. Well, um, the bylaw a, says the bylaw says that. So right. right I'm just wondering if that eliminates that eliminates your first condition. Yeah, we we. I mean, this is this is what we can get out of the property. So no, we would not um, be at any further. So no, I know you can. I just yeah. seems that that in the first condition about not extending the driveway are redundant. But yeah, yeah. Never well, it's whatever stuff. the board feels comfortable with. I I. I mean, this is what we can do at, at this property, and I never, don't see that we can do anything further. Better to have too many conditions than too few, I guess. Tony, the bylaw also says that the uh, common driveway or any driveway has to be uh, 90 degrees to the road for the first 20 feet. Yeah. Uh, and I can't tell from this um, whether that is from the road to the property line. Is that 20 feet? Um, I'm not sure. Can you, um, let me look here. I got a blow up in my thing. Um, Give me just a second. I'll be right back. Someone let me know which page we're on in the book. Page four. four. Uh, hold on. Three. Hmm. Page four. Sorry, the topic to, says to five of eight. Scale. I think that includes the title page. So um, off the edge of the road to the right of way, it's um, probably 13 feet, which is typical because um, the road is 50 foot right of way and the, the street is um, probably 23 feet wide in pavement. So our, um, Radius is 150. Um, I mean, Tony, that, yeah, I mean, that it's 100 pretty, foot radius, 150 foot radius is not very sharp. So I mean, no, it, no, it's, it's pretty, not. It's a, it appears that it's fairly close to perpendicular. Um, one other comment at Masterson Road is only a 40 foot layout, not a 50 foot layout. So, um, other than that, you know, I see you have 10 foot radiuses on the, you know, on either side of the entry. Yep. Um, the one thing I don't know, and I had a one question is the, the location, just to make sure that I don't have a catch basin in that driveway entrance, you know, offhand, did you, did, when they did well, this, the, they, 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 they didn't pick anything up there. Okay. They didn't pick I mean, it's swale. Um, Pete didn't pick anything up when he was out there. Um, so I don't believe there there is anything there. Uh, I don't remember seeing it in my, you know, I've been out there a few times with the Conservation Commission and just walking it, and I don't remember seeing a catch basin there. Yeah, the, the drainage line is in the middle of the road um, with manholes and catch basins on either side. So I know it goes further up the hill. Um, right. And you're right. I would assume that if there was a base in there, he would have picked it up and it would have been right. detailed. Right. Yeah, it's definitely, it's running down the, the side of the road. I mean, it's, we've got a little hump in there. So, um, um, yeah, I would tend to believe that there would be those catch basins, but he didn't pick anything up, Keith. So I, I'm assuming it's, it's, they're on the road, but they're not at that location where we're coming in. Well, it looks like we've probably got a small radius in there, but I think for all intents and purposes, we can we can consider this uh, ninety degrees to the road. You, yeah, you know, it's one hundred and fifty feet. That's a pretty pretty large radius. Yeah. That probably meets public street standards. To be honest with you, you have any problem with that, Keith? No, that's that's very you know that's a very minor curve. Um, and again, 
you know, I wouldn't recommend going any smaller on a 10 foot radius on the outsides. You might, you know, might even want to consider a 15s, but um, cause at this point in time, what'd you say? 12, six, 16 feet wide was it Tony? Yeah. 16 with two foot shoulders on either side. So it's essentially a 20 foot travel. Right, so, right. So if you go 16, so you're talking 36 feet at the road. Um, that's, you know, that's not any, any too much. I'll say that much. Um, it certainly wouldn't be a problem if you went to a 15 foot radius. No, we could do that if you, it's, it's okay. And I'm not, I'm not saying you have to, I'm just saying it's just a suggestion. Yep. I think if that does get changed, um, the planning board would not, uh, certainly not call out call out on it so other than that you know looking at it you know in this case here john asked john the fire chief asked me to you know to weigh in on the the fire side of things um this one's pretty straightforward as far as a short distance um it's not a long common driveway so it doesn't pose any issues as far as needing pull-offs it right. has a the the hammerhead on the end, so um, it meets the requirements there as far as turning around. Um, I don't see any issue from a fire standpoint either from the fire department, speaking as the deputy chief. Um, and then again, I don't see any other issues in regards to the highway side of it as highway superintendent. I. Um, my biggest concern in not knowing exactly where the location was out on Masterson was that it wasn't impacting any of the current catch basins. Okay, can you uh, give us a letter stating that, Keith? Yes, I can. I'll draft something up and submit it to you, Don. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board? We have a motion to approve. Do we have, I will move to approve it subject to the two conditions that Tony stipulated, which I hope he will give us in writing. I could do that. Could I have a reminder just to note what condition to refer to? Does, Yes, um, if you go to the bylaw section 171.11, um, there is um, um, E2 in parentheses, it says a specialist permit shall state that the driveway is not a public or private road and that does not meet standards for tone, uh, town drive. And, and so um, I think that should be in there just for um, purposes of uh, these buyers, if they, you know, buy the, the special permit will be on there, show up on the title of the property. And so that's very clear that they cannot come petition the town to take this as a public way. Um, and then I think the other one is that, um, and this is entirely up to the board, but uh, um, that this common driveway cannot be extended to serve additional lots or um, it just it just states in the permit what is mentioned as item six in that section of the code. I'd, I'd like to add a third condition. Um, number one, E1 says that a recorded easement providing permanent access shall be provided. We have the text, but I think we need to condition that we get the recorded copy. Yeah, and my my goal on that, um, Judy, is to put that on the AR plan. So it's recorded there. And then when the attorney writes the deeds, he'll be able to refer back to the AR plan that shows that 40 foot easement. Okay. Yeah, that's my goal, but that's a good condition. That's fine. Yeah. Any more comments or questions from the board? Okay, I'll take a vote. Sarah? Yes. Judy? Yes. Tom? Yes. 
Brent? Yes. And Don, yes. Motion passes unanimously. I will get the, um, I've got a copy of the successful permit application and I will um, get the copies out. Well, great, thank you. Keith, thank you for your input. Um, we'll make that adjustment to the plan on the radii and um, supply an updated um, plan to the board for the record. And I uh, just wanna thank you all for your patience on this project. It's been slow moving um, and a, a lot of people involved. So thank you very much for your time and um, uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you, Tony. Tony. All right, John, I don't think you had any other thing you needed from me, did you? That was it. Okay. Have a Thank good night. Thank you very everybody. much, Keith. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Keith. Okay. Um, Sovereign Builders. Can you unshare? Yeah. Yeah. Good evening. I'm Todd Silera from Sovereign Builders. I'm Rob Levesque from Ottawa Bank Associates. How are you? Okay. Um, you want to bring up a plan and show us what's going on? Sure thing. Um, can I share? Is it okay to share my screen? Yes. Okay, let me try to do that. Sarah, Sarah may have to. Nope, oh, I already did it. Okay. I was a little better prepared this time. <laughs> okay, with any luck, you folks are looking at my screen. Yep. Okay. Okay, so yeah, so again, for the record, Rob Levesque from our Levesque Associates representing uh, Sovereign Builders, and again, Todd Silver is with us this evening. Um, I'm the landscape architect and project manager on the project, I'm president of our, our Lebec Associates, uh, as well as Steve Cravo is the PE on the project. Ryan from our office uh, did a wetland delineation out there and um, we have some extensive information. So we'll, if it's okay and it pleases the board, what I'd like to do is just kind of go through the, uh, the plans kind of sheet by sheet, um, do a cursory review, and then I can certainly answer any questions in the back. I'm having a little trouble hearing. Sure. Okay. Um, is it That's are, better. Trouble, or is it is it is that better? Yes. yes. Great. I'll speak up then. I apologize. Uh, again, so we we are proposing a self storage facility located off of State Road, um, parcel uh, map five, parcel twenty nine. Um, here's a little locus map for you, kind of showing the location, basically. Uh, between State Road and uh, 91 in general. I would 10, it's shown right there. Um, actually, we're on the, just on the other side. Um, so we have a nice, fairly flat site. Um, route, route 5, State Road being out here. Uh, our frontage is along there. There is a pretty extensive stream, perennial stream in bordering vegetated wetland along the front of the property. We have conducted a site visit uh, with the Conservation Commission and received a determination on the wetland boundaries um, not too long ago, probably early winter. Um, we have also conducted uh, extensive test pits throughout the site uh, to determine uh, uh, the seasonal high groundwater and soil pipes for drainage. So those test pits that you are these little squares that you see on the plan in different various locations based on what we anticipated for uh, stormwater. Uh, as you can also see, there's an existing 36 inch culvert that runs under uh, the culvert runs underneath an existing access way. Um, we're proposing to utilize the existing access way and then um, work in the area uh, pretty much beyond the riverfront area. To be Excuse me, I'm still having a little trouble picking up all <laughs> the details. Okay, I'll, I'll slow down and I'll speak up. Um, I just, just to recap that, um, we have provided uh, information to the Conservation Commission and they've determined our wetland boundaries. Um, and obviously we we're before the planning board this evening uh, for the proposed project because we stripped uh, site plan approval. Um, 
So what we're proposing, uh, this is this is the area, this is the limit of work, this is a demolition and removals plan. So this area with inside this uh, dark line here, that's our limit of work or road control boundary. Uh, so we're proposing to pretty much stay almost entirely out of the riverfront area. Uh, we have to go through it, get to our site. Um, so we're going to use that existing access way. And what you see here, this is the proposed layout plan. We have uh, a couple, uh, three different buildings that we're proposing. These are for self-storage. Uh, the main building would be climate controlled, and that's 20,800 square feet of climate controlled uh, uh, self-storage. We also have a 5,400 square foot building um, here, and then we have another 4,600 square foot building here. Uh, as you can imagine, for self-storage, there's very little parking required, just loading along the building um, and then access for the self-storage. Uh, so we have uh, handicap accessible space and then a few other space, two other spaces here to accommodate as folks come in. Uh, the majority of people will basically pull in front of their units um, for those of the, those folks that are going into the, um, the, store, the uh, climate control, they would utilize these spaces here. We have... As mentioned, we're utilizing pretty much the existing curb cut. We're coming across the uh, existing wetland area there that is already crossed. We'll have to expand that to accommodate the uh, required 24 foot wide drive lane on the way in. Um, we're trying to stay to the, um, we we'll call that to the south side of the property so that um, we're avoiding as much riverfront area as possible on the way in. Um, once we're through, we have a proposed infiltration basin that I'll get into in further detail on the uh, grading in the drainage sheet. There's an infiltration basin here, and then we also have another bioretention area here. The site is fairly flat, so in order to accommodate the runoff and the required pretreatment and attenuation of flows, um, we have those two areas located as well. We also have a few additional parking spaces that are parallel along the bottom of the building. There's about three spaces there. Our drive aisles are 30 foot, so that we're accommodating not only the, the folks driving um, around the building, um, but also we're accommodating folks that want to pull up and then to be able to, you know, pull out um, something from their vehicles and then bring it into their storage and vice versa, take it out and put it load their vehicles. Rob, I've got a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, Don Sluter. Um, the existing access, is that considered a driveway? Um, I would say yes, it's considered a driveway, uh, but in what regards there, just to, just to clarify your question. Well, the, 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 um, the board that we don't, we don't do, uh, sorry, control driveways, the uh, select board does, and their regulations say that it has to be 20 feet off the property line. If it's existing, um, that probably doesn't make any difference, uh, but uh, just be, be aware that you'll probably have to get a, a private driveway permit through the select board. And I think that, you know, because there is wetland in there, that's probably a, uh, a reason to stay back close to the property line, but I just wanted to let you know. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. So we'll confirm. So uh, obviously, uh, any any access permits we need for the driveway, we'll certainly coordinate with uh, through the selectmen. Um, yeah. And I I would argue that we do have it along the frontage, but it does make sense for us to curve in and then kind of hug the property line to the south. So. I'll, I'll confirm that this either is uh, is compliant or if we need to seek uh, relief on that, we will. Right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Rob, this is uh, Tom Litwin. Um, what is the structure and design for crossing the river right at the front of the property? Yep. So right now there's an existing 36 inch culvert that's not, that's not big enough. So what we need to do is increase that. And we're proposing, in, and I have some details of that on, on subsequent sheets, um, but we're proposing, you know, essentially what, what I would call an open bottom concrete box culvert uh, in order to meet the stream crossing standards and the openness ratio that DEP requires under their standards. Um, we have to have a certain opening to that, to that structure. Um, so that would be an, a proposed open bottom box culvert. And I have that and I think it's on details 
she d6. So I can get to that as well. If I Is that all right? Do you want me to keep going or? Yep. Let's let's just remember this is a preliminary overview and we'll have to do it in detail again. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll official be permit. So <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm reminding the board, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, great. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of keep moving if it's okay. Uh, so just real quick, this is the grading sheet. Uh, site's fairly flat, as you can imagine, for a self-storage site. Um, we have a couple low points in our parking lot. Those pick up the water from the parking lot, and then they convey it to um, the stormwater system that we have here. Um, and there's also a little bit of a basin here that I, don't, I failed to mention before. Um, the drainage, just real quick is picked up by deep sump catch basins, runs through an underground conveyance system uh, to a water quality unit that, that then runs to a, um, a flared end that uh, is collected in a sediment four bay. Um, all of this uh, will allow us to meet the, the uh, performance standards for both um, as well as water quality. In addition, we also have this basin here that picks up some additional roof drainage, runs to the, the north side, and then there is a, a small system here um, that actually, uh, this is the actual the leach field, sorry, I, uh, to clarify my previous statement, that's the leach field here. So it comes to a, um, a, a septic tank and then a, a, pump, a pump chamber that then goes to the leach field here. We imagine there'd be very little flow, um, but still have to provide uh, sanitary facilities. Just a quick question before you move on as Branch Hikus. Um, how are you gonna handle snow removal? Uh, so typical to a site like this, um, we would, you know, in, in minor events, um, we would anticipate that it would be plowed to the sides of the road, obviously needs to be removed from the front of the buildings. Um, so it probably would be stacked generally to, towards the north. Um, obviously we wanna make sure that the gravel filter strip that is located up there is, is maintained. Um, so oftentimes, uh, it, it, and this is uh, our answer a lot, a lot actually, um, it may need to be trucked off site in certain, in certain instances. Um, typically multiple snow events, um, the maintenance of these facilities is, can get a little tricky. We did orient these buildings generally north to south, uh, specific to the solar exposure. We wanted to make sure that the sun ideally, to the extent possible, would be running up the aisles so that it's a bit easier to maintain. But I would I would rec I would uh, suggest that what will probably happen is it be uh, pushed up the aisles uh, to the north and to the south, um, and then uh, as needed would be trucked off site. Uh, Mr. Salor and Sovereign Builders has equipment. Um, assuming they would manage it, or if it's someone else, they would they would likely need to get a loader on site and remove it um, on occasion. Okay. Does uh, proximity to wetlands mean that? You're going to have to be careful about what kind of treatments you're going to put down on these roadways during the winter time. Uh, we haven't gotten to the notice of intent stage on this, but I would think you're absolutely right. Um, there, the commission will like the conservation commission will likely have a number of conditions that would okay. include um, what they would like to see or not see to maintain the property. If, if, if I could add a little bit to that, because the buildings are light gauge steel, salt is not a desired product so it would be sand only typically because if you if you spread salt then you're going to erode the the steel building sure sure okay but then that just reinforces that as part of the planning board process we'll need the documentation from the conservation commission about okay thank you absolutely um we have some basic landscaping. The front of the site is pretty much going to remain completely vegetated. So the nice thing about this is that other than a, uh, you know, a little sign out front um, kind of showing folks how to get to the facility, um, pretty much this whole corridor uh, all the way in here is all going to remain uh, as existing vegetation. Our limit of work again in this uh, crenulated pattern that you see here is the tree line, the proposed tree line. So it just gives you some uh, some idea of what we're dealing with. We do have a couple other trees, uh, but obviously being an industrial property and really um, all the vegetation back here will remain. 
uh, so a little bit on the north for a buffer, uh, as well as some plantings in the stormwater basin. Um, other than that, um, we're really not proposing any major landscaping, um, but you know, certainly if it seemed appropriate, we, we could look at additional, but it seemed, seemed logical the way we were kind of proposing it. And what about fencing? Uh, great question. So that's actually something we should probably discuss. And maybe Mr. Salura can speak to it. He's done a number of these facilities. I think the last one that you did, Mr. Salura, did not have a fence um, around the entire facility, but had a gate. Correct. It did not. And in this case, because of the, the access quarter being as long as it is, uh, it, and, you know, a gate would be sufficient. It would be very difficult to, to get to this site on foot or in a vehicle with just a gate. So you'd, you'd end up, you know, if somebody wanted to access the site after hours, um, they'd end up having to go through a wetland or so. So I, it's pretty secure without, uh, mm -hmm. just in the, in the natural topography of the site and the, and the fact that it's got wetlands on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think a gate uh, we, we proposed a gate at the, at the access road. And I, I yeah, I don't, I don't know. Okay. I, yeah. Yeah. Cause there might be some board conditions if there are fencing or chain link or security fencing or things like that. So I guess if, for the hearing, we'll just want to be clear on planned fencing. Yeah, we, it's interesting. We and we may want to look at this with the board and with Mr. Sawyer, but where I'm seeing our entrance gate is actually quite a ways in. We may logically want to bring that um, back towards the street. Uh, again, I think we want people to be able to pull off if they go the wrong, you know, or if they want to take a turn around and get back onto the road. Um, but our gate, to me, and just kind of expressing this now, <laughs> seems like it's in a funny spot. So maybe we. Yeah. Get that back towards the street. Agreed. So those are the plans in general. I'll kind of let you know where we stand at this point. So uh, and it's kind of interesting, and I'll go back to, sorry for skipping around, but um, this wetland resource area, there's a portion of that uh, that is within what's called bordering land subject to flooding, which is essentially the 100 year floodplain. Um, unfortunately, FEMA in, uh, over time has mapped these and not sometimes not provided um, an elevation associated therewith. So the, uh, the process for determining that elevation so that we can in fact determine the proper amount of bordering land subject to flooding that we would be um, uh, impacting and then thereby required to be providing compensatory storage for that impact. Um, we need to determine that through uh, you know, an H&H &H study so hydrologic and hydraulic uh, study of that uh, stream corridor. Um, we're in the process of working on that now, expect to have that done shortly, in, at, at which time we'll be filing with the Conservation Commission. That's actually delayed a little bit farther than we expected. So um, probably as, you, as we're all aware, this is a preliminary uh, discussion at this point. So um, it would be logical to, you know, obviously for us to request the continuance to a point at which we felt that you know um, the planning board you know could felt more comfortable to discuss this further and also ideally we would like to try to um, get the conservation filing in prior to the next time we meet. We would probably have a condition that 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 would preclude uh, actually building until you've got that. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that's the, that's the gist of it. I'd be happy to answer any further questions you may have. Um, obviously, um, it's a good site for storage. It's secluded. You really won't see it. Um, it's really just a matter of getting the, uh, you know, making sure we meet your performance standards and getting through the conservation process, which is probably uh, a little bit, a little bit trickier. Um, you can't see it on this plan, but um, it's pretty heavily uh, both abutters, um, it's pretty heavily wooded. So there would not be a problem with uh, light pollution. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, I believe. Uh, I think that's a fair statement. Um, I do also have 
uh, a photometric plan that has been provided. Uh, we work using a company called Illuminate. Um, and what they've done is they've showed a series of wall packs on the main building that essentially illuminates all of the aisles in the outer buildings uh, would arguably act as a screen in addition to the fact that those are a dark sky compliant downlit um, lights, wall pack lights. So yeah, so there shouldn't be any spillover and then the vegetation on top of what we're already showing, you know, which is gonna basically be around the perimeter to keep everything uh, pretty dark. Out. And, and would this be accessible 24 seven? Question: uh, Todd, well, how, do, how do these work? It it it's doubtful that we'll allow it to be open twenty four seven. It's more more than likely have a have a cutoff time of in the range of eleven p.m. I see. So it could be reasonable that after you know after hours lights would be would be turned off, and if you have security, you're doing with night sensitive cameras. We would have cameras that are infrared capable, and certainly we can have we can set a limit on the lights in terms of shutting off at you know at eleven p.m. or something like that. We can put them on timers. Absolutely. Okay. It's not a site that I intend to have access twenty four seven. Okay. Uh, just for the for the board's uh, clarification, there was a question regarding the culvert. So this uh, smaller tangle represents the existing culvert. The, uh, this here and this here represent the new walls of the culvert. Um, this is a cross section of the culvert, kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about. So there'd basically be footings on either side. These open bottom box culverts typically are framed in place, all of one piece. Um, yeah, there's a company out of Southwick Mass, uh, Aero Concrete, that that uh, we typically get those from, but they're, uh, they usually come in sections and they get framed into place uh, pretty easy to work with and, and around. Okay. Along the side lines of lighting, this is on a state highway. Um, what kind of- Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Can I continue? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so access onto the highway. So how many cars anticipated per day and also the lighting on signage and the location of signage. So as far as uh, a trip generation number, I can get you that number. They are very low. So they're very low. Um, I can get that for you. I'll have that for your next meeting for sure. Um, the uh, and then being on a, a state highway, obviously, uh, any curb cut permits that would be required uh, in that particular section, or whether that's jurisdictional under um, the town. Either way, we'll make sure that we coordinate that. As far as signage, um, it would be logical uh, that we would have that um, right out in front. Um, let me see if we show that or if there's. Um, I think it's very pylon sign, um, nine square feet, height of 10 feet with nine square feet. I believe that meets your um, standard, but um, I'll, have to, I'll have to double check because I, I wasn't the one that, that did that sign piece. But um, so yeah, that's, it was proposed. I guess that's on the north side of the curb cut right there. Can you see that right there, a little rectangle? Oh yeah. So that would be under the ZBA anyway. Yes, but I was just wanted to make sure we knew where that was. Yep. Well, does the board feel a uh, need for any additional preliminary information? I don't think so. Okay. Um, we're going to continue the hearing until the next regular meeting, which is, um, what's the regular, I don't have my calendar up. So the last Tuesday of April would be the 27th of April, Tuesday, the 27th.
typically the same time? Um, they start at five. Do we want to put it on for a different time, Don? Um, I don't have any audio. We can hear you though. Maybe you should mute Judy or because she's talking into her microphone. <laughs> we can hear her. I think she's now listening to us. Good. Oh. I lost I lost all the audio about five minutes ago. <laughs> you got it now? Just she's got phone. a good workaround. Yeah. Judy, maybe you should try disconnecting and reconnecting. Before I do, I was going to suggest, I don't think any of the plants on Southern Builders have show the location of the abutters buildings, and I think that would be very helpful. The abutter buildings or the abutter? We have the abutters. Yeah, but the, there's a house. There's there's a house to the south, I believe. It's you can't see how close it is, or or, and I think generally, that's helpful to see. So I think Judy's suggesting just expand, provide an expanded view of your plan that shows in the diagram where the abutters are. Okay. Are you guys okay with me utilizing an aerial photograph to scale and underlaying it under my plan? Because I, I don't want to intrude or trespass on anybody's property to locate it. Is that okay? Fine. Generally, that would work. Okay. Okay. I'll have that for the next meeting before the next meeting. Um, so does anybody else have any questions before we continue this? Anybody from the public? Okay, we're going to continue it until, uh, we'll go ahead and wait until 5.15 on the 29th. The 20th, did I? I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Today's 30th. Thirtieth. So it's. Tuesday, the 27th of April. Great. Appreciate your time tonight, folks. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you all. Have a great night. Okay. And that was 5.15 done? First, first? Yeah. Okay. Okay, the next thing on the agenda is uh, Sobieski ANR. That's me. <laughs> Dave Enberg from Berkshire Design. Um, the NR um, request form uh, wasn't signed by the owner. Got her name in there, but no signature. Uh, I thought there was a, there was an option either by the applicant or the owner. Uh, it says on there if, if signature of owner, if not the applicant. Uh, I can get that taken care of. Okay. Yeah, and then just give me uh, like three copies. Okay. Will that preclude you from looking at it? No, nope, no, nope, not at all. I just okay. want to know that, that that's. I, would, I will. I will make sure that it gets taken care of. Okay. Can you um, show this? Do you want me to? I can share my screen. Great. Excuse I me, think. Dave. Could could you just repeat your last name for the minutes, please? Uh, it's Enberg, E-N-B-E-R-G. Thank you. Uh, can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. Yes. So this is a uh, survey that we did for the Department of Agricultural Resources. Um, uh, and they are putting us in agricultural preservation. Um, they retain, the, they're creating one lot for the residential um, house and, and uh, down in the, up in the upper north northeast corner, um, the rest of this will be put into agricultural preservation. Um, so, we, as you can see, there's one sort of hammer-shaped parcel and one long strip uh, adjacent to it, and that's all part of the remaining land. Um, parcel one. Um, is 
Let me zoom in on that a little bit further. If it'll do it. I'm not sure why I can get closer to parcel one, but that's about an acre, a little over an acre, and the rest of the property is about 20. So the whole thing is about 21 and change acres. Nope. So this is gonna be two parcels? Yes. Okay, so parcel one is a house lot? Yes. Everything else is under remaining land? Yes. Okay. I don't see any problem with that. Anybody on, else on the board have any questions? Okay, well, I've got the originals on these. And um, if you can either drop off the um, signed permit at the town sure. office or let me know and I can meet you somewhere. Okay, I will, I'll, uh, I'll be in touch with that. Okay. Um, I've got your email, so. Will you be able to sign this today? Uh, not today. Or, or sign it somehow. <laughs> yeah. So what I'll do is I will go into, I will um, stamp it and sign it and get it ready to go. And then board members can come in and sign it. Okay. I'll probably take two or three days. That's fine. Okay. That'll give me time to get the uh, other thing to you, the signature to you. You can just bring that bring that in all at the same time. Yeah. Okay. All right. I under, yeah. Okay. Good. I have to I have to contact the owner and, and all that. So. Okay. Is this something that the board votes on in ANR? We just sort yep. of do. Yep. So I would entertain a motion to accept to approve. So moved. Do I have a second? Seconded. Thomas seconded. Um, do a roll call vote. Judy, can you hear? Yes. And you vote? I, I vote yes. Okay. Sarah? Yes. Tom? Yes. Brent? Yes. Don, yes. So the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, um, you wanna unshare your screen? Yes. I figure how to do that. <laughs> uh, Usually it's up at the top. Yeah. Oh. There. There we go. Okay, the next thing on the Thank you very much for free approval and enjoy, no the rest of, enjoy the rest of your evening. All, All right. right. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, site plan conditions for the, for the um, LaSalle marijuana grow. Yeah. Can I select? So I drafted and sent, and sent around um, a first draft, I saw Mary sent out some notes earlier that added something about water that I must, I've forgotten that I think I, Sarah brought up. So um, I don't know what makes sense. I can, I could share the document so we can work on the, the language together. Would that be helpful? That sounds good. Okay. So Sarah, while I'm looking for the document, just sh give me permission to share my screen. Yeah, every, it's given. I see it now. Very good, thank you. By the way, is the address 23A LaSalle Drive or just 23 LaSalle Drive? Uh, you can do just 23. Um, the A was from, there's more than one uh, farmhouse on the property, so, but that's not important. They all come to the same, same place. Okay. 
right. A part would be a separate building, that's all. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, almost there, just give me one quick second here. Uh, view fit to window. And Hi everybody, Chris Simony is on. I'm just uh, in the car. I'll be in front of video in a couple of minutes. I had a meeting room late, so I apologize. Okay, all right, let's not hear a crash. <laughs> I had that happen in a meeting the other day. Someone was had the video going, and we we heard and saw it all. But no one was hurt, thankfully. But uh, okay. a little fender bender. All right, very good. So um, I think the first condition that we talked about is a uh, is non controversial. The plan must receive approvals from all the appropriate boards and committees. All right. Uh, and again, I will just again remind everyone I was going off my notes. So this is our chance to make sure we understand the wording and the intent of each condition and we, we get it right. Because uh, whatever we produce tonight will be the conditions. So there was um, discussion about landscape planting. So I had notes that said, um, that we wanted to use native plant varieties. So there was, I, I'm a little, I was a little unclear in my notes. Like, are we saying to Canna Select that they should only use river birch, dragon, lady holly, and American holly? Or are we saying that their landscape plantings should use native varieties, including those three as examples? So I'm asking for feedback on the way I wrote this sentence. And then I had other notes about, oh, you know, let's avoid arborvitaes as one example because they attract deer. So I translated that into the second sentence. Yeah. So again, all of this is subject to feedback. If that's, what, that's the conversation I wanna have right now. Feedback on this condition. Neil? You're, you're the one, one of the ones we're looking to for feedback here, right? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, I, I stated that I'm happy to use those species. Um, and the person who brought up those specific species, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but uh, he seemed to be very, be very pleased that I would commit to just, just using those species. He didn't say anything about exclusively using those right. species. So if we change the wording as follow, like to such as, like to... Or should we simply not mention any species at all? That's, that's on your call, I'd say. That's up to you guys. Yeah, this is Chris. I, we're happy to do whatever, honestly, as long as it looks nice and it's you know it, it's uh, viewed positively by everybody. Sure. We're happy to do whatever. Tom, it seems to me you were the source of some of this knowledgeable feedback. Could you elaborate? Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think with the such such as in there is fine, but I would leave the species in there to give examples of the quality that we're looking for, as opposed to arborvitae. I mean, you wouldn't lump arborvitae in with river birch, dragon, lady holly, and American holly. Um, and this, the next sentence, I, I, I would, um, not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure we need that. I'm not wedded to it by any means. So unless I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call white-tailed deer undesirable wildlife. I think what what we're, what we're getting at is that arborvitae is routinely grazed on by white-tailed deer, and it doesn't do much of a job of screening once it's grazed on. Okay. Also, we don't want just a mono culture. Right. We right. like a variegated to make it, and natural and native species make it blend a little better and often survive, the survivability is higher. What we've done in the past is to say a mixed uh, planting of deciduous and non-deciduous native plants. Okay, so uh, mixed, mixed assortment of deciduous, Just testing my spelling capabilities native plant varieties. Shall I use a mixed assortment? Or I, now let's just say, shall I use a mixture 
of deciduous and non-deciduous native plant varieties such as river birch, dragon lady holly, and American holly. I think that's I don't remember great. if you specified height or not in the previous discussion. I'm sorry, what was that, Judy, about height? Yeah, I don't remember if you specified the height of the screening trees when they were planted. Ah, so is there a recommendation we add that, you know, uh, at time of planting, um, landscape plantings must be at least X feet in height? Yeah, so that's typically what we do. And caliper, the di diameter of breast height. All right, come on, let's, let's first, let me, let's nail down the, the initial height, the time of planting um, pl plants must be at least how high? Six feet, five feet, three feet? You're trying to screen. So six feet. Six feet. I would, I would suggest that at the, at the time of planting, that means we have to get adult plants. And um, if we could plant smaller plants that, that grow to be uh, that tall, that would be probably make the whole thing a lot easier. Um, we could still plant ones that start out at like two or three feet easily. Planting it, those, those particular bushes get very, not just tall, but very wide. Um, it would be very difficult to plant those particular species when they're that large. I don't even know if they would survive that kind of transplant either. Yeah. yeah they, they'd survive all right. Would they? Okay, I haven't done it before. Not something that big. <laughs> my, I guess my concern there is if you looked at some of these other projects, they put in a two or three foot tree and it sits there for five years and the whole point of the screening and responding to the neighbors is to have screening in a reasonable time frame and a, a two foot, two foot high river river birch is going to take a long time before you even notice it. Uh, I see. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar. Thank you for that input because I'm not familiar with those species and how how they progress. So, do we need to specify a number? I'm propose. What about this language? A time of planting plants must be of sufficient height to provide adequate screening. Yeah, here's here's one thing we need to consider. We're not going to be planting anything out in the open. So what people are going to see are going to be the greenhouses that they already see. And I would think if you're going up to the top of the, uh, the uh, horizontal wall, which is what, four, six feet, something like that. Mm -hmm. if you've got some things that are up that high and then some that are going to come up higher. I think that that would be adequate personally. Because there's nothing that is going to offend anybody any more than they're already being offended by seeing the greenhouses. Yeah. So what's your feedback, Don, on the language here? I, I think if we leave it that way, it's loose enough. Uh, we don't have all plants, we just have plants. So if we've got some low stuff in there, it's gonna take a while to grow, that's fine. We've got some other stuff that's gonna be, so it's gonna be a distraction more, more really than a, than a screen. I think escape landscape plants must be of sufficient height. All right. Can we live with that wording? I'm assuming that everyone is seeing the, the wording as I'm playing with it here. I'm gonna make you groan with a technical point, but my guess is Dragon Lady Holly is a cultivar, not a native plant. So I can strike the word native. Or dragon or, lady. Or dragon lady holly. Or that variety, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure where that came from, dragon lady holly. It was in my notes, so I'm happy to get rid of dragon lady holly since I can't tell a dragon lady holly from a, you know, <laughs> dragon fellow American. holly. Yeah, all right. <laughs> What about American holly? Is that a native? I think that sounds okay pretty there. negative. What's that? I'm sorry, what was that, Sarah? Sounds pretty native. 
Native, okay, oh, well, yes. <laughs> At least native to the Americas. All right, are we comfortable with this about plantings? Yes, no, maybe so, we can move on to the next one, which I have all kinds of concerns about even though I wrote it. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna move on from landscape plantings. So I will say I wrote this and I have a lot of mixed feelings about it. So again, I'll rem remind the board of this, what, what I consider to be somewhat hard to interpret language in the bylaw that says that, uh, I have to grab it again, that basically says the uh, solar, I'm sorry, the, um, yeah, that, mar that except for outdoor cultivation, which is, this is not marijuana establishment shall be required to prepare detail at blah, blah, blah. Cultivators in buildings and greenhouses shall generate a minimum of 50% of their projected energy use on site where feasible. That where feasible is a huge, you know, kind of loophole, which is fine. Um, we talked at the last meeting about, and I think there was with Neil and company, there seemed to be a general, my notes suggested there was some feedback, like they don't want to be required on day one, and nor would I, frankly, to have to install a big solar array. Um, we talked about kind of something that, that Canna Select might agree to meeting this part of the bylaw within three years of commencement of operation. Hence the way I opened this condition within three years of commencement of operation. And then I wrote like, well, the facility shall generate the facility. Now shall generate at least 50% of its average annual electricity on site. Now that's a little bit, that wording is a little bit different. So first I'm gonna say, the wording here is a little bit different than in the bylaw. The bylaw just says, shall generate a minimum of 50% of their projected, ener projected energy use on site where feasible. Could we put where feasible in there in, in best efforts or something like that? Because yeah. I, don't, I wanna make sure it's, it's a cost effective. Uh, so this is the thing, and this is where quite frankly, and thank you for bringing it up, Chris. And again, I, I, I need advice from the board here. Sure. This, this question about, you know, where feasible, even I tried to capture it um, in that second sentence, you'll notice, Chris, on-site generation capacity may be reduced to the amount that is economically practicable. Since I've seen that phrase, economically practical, used in other conditions and, you know, other things that the, the planning board has agreed to. Um, so on the one end, if I were can of select, I might say, well, you know, in three years, they'll come back and say, hey, this is not economically practical. I need, um, I need return on investment in one year and I'm not gonna get it for three years. So I guess the question, I, I'm really on the fence about this, with, I think Whether that, we, where we are with this as a board, how hard we're going to try to enforce this particular energy efficiency provision. And I think that at the last meeting, uh, we tried to jack the, the three years up to whatever made, um, made sense to the owners. And um, I don't remember who said it, but they said that by three years, it should not be a problem at all. Yeah. I mean, what I imagine with Canna Select is, I think I understand the spirit of this provision in the bylaw. I wasn't involved in writing the bylaw, but the spirit was we want to make sure these tend to be very electricity intensive operations. And we want to make sure that if we allow an energy intensive operation to take up, take take hold in town, we want them to 
be proactive in reducing their energy footprint. Um, it's not gonna be realistic for anybody to make a big solar investment right on day one. Um, so something like three years seems reasonable. This is not built into the bylaw. Um, but I, I don't know, I guess the question that I would ask the board is, um, these, these permits are re renewed annually, is that correct? No. Like, so at the end of three years, what could potentially happen here? What would, what might Canna Select do? They might, what might they be expected to do to say, we, we have or have not done this, or if we haven't done this, we're not generating 50% of our use on site. We're not doing it because it's not economically practicable and here's why. Is that something that we would have to then in three years evaluate? They'd have to present a case to the planning board as to why they're not generating 50% of their energy on site? Do we wanna be dealing with that? There, and I'm sorry to just be shooting my mouth off, but I'm so on both sides of this particular condition. Part of me wants to strike it completely. And part of me feels like, well, there's, it's in the bylaw, so we ought to be doing something appropriate to enforce that part of the bylaw. Well, I think, I think at the end of three, if we're not gonna deal with it at the end of three years, there's no point in having it at all. It's a, it's a paper tiger. Right. Um, so I think you, you assume that the, the, the owners are proceeding in good faith and will provide at, at the board's request an energy audit to see if they've met, if they can or can't meet the guideline. And if they can't meet the guideline, why is that? And the board makes a decision. One, one thing to think about is that these are reviewed, these permits are only good for five years. We are unlikely to review it on our own before then. Uh -huh. They have to reapply after five years. Uh -huh. And another thing that it doesn't directly bear on the wording, but I think you got at the sense of it earlier when you mentioned big electricity users. When we wrote the 50% solar, we were really envisioning large, totally enclosed building. Right. The, the major electrical users. And on earlier applications, it didn't come up with DMTC because they were, it didn't apply to them. But with Urban Grown and Mustang, we kind of implicitly gave credit to the fact that solar is being used to grow the plants. You know, they're getting sunlight, mm -hmm. so they're using less electricity. I, it didn't translate formally. And Mustang does have a solar facility of their own anyway, but but I think we have sort of thought about that as when we deal with something with greenhouses. So, so do you feel, Judy, that we should keep a provision like this as one of the conditions here or strike it? Well, I'm still recused, so I probably shouldn't have said Oh, that. that's right. I apologize. Um, no, but I, I would, if, I would keep it and make it five years. I see. So within five years of... Well, I think if, if you keep it, make it five years. Yeah. Since I think that's a good point that this would not be... This whole issue wouldn't come back to the planning board's attention until the special permit was up for renewal. That sounds good. I agree with that. Okay, Chris and Neil, how do you feel about this as worded? So I think, again, I'd like best efforts and things of that nature added in there just because again, we want to make sure, I think that maybe that, that last sentence does the trick. Um, you know, something that brings up a different question is that at the end of the five year period, if we're not able to do it, what happens? Because again, there's going to be significant capital investment in the site that I don't want to have five years go by and we say, oh, you know right. what, you didn't hit this. Now, 
Right. Too bad you just put X number of dollars into the site and uh, you didn't hit this 50% thing. Um, I again, think we're, the answer to that is that the planning board is not allowed to make a condition that's economically um, would put you out of business. Okay. Can we, okay, we don't need to put anything like that in there then. I, under, I understand. So I think in general, this is fine. I think uh, we're going to try to do this anyways, obviously, because it, it helps the project anyway. So I think yeah. uh, Neil and, and Bob, are you good with that too? I think it makes sense to me. I like it the way yeah. it is, yeah. And really, that's another reason why I, I'm, I have questions about this whole thing, because it seems like it would be to your advantage as a business, if you're a heavy user of electricity, to try to, you know, not to, to get as much of that free from the sun. <laughs> yep. And you could do that through an investment. I have to say, by the way, I looked again at the numbers that you estimated for your electric use, and I it seemed wildly on the high side to me, but you know, I'm not an expert in this. I only know I'm I I consume 10 megawatts for my one house. And it seemed like you were talking about two orders of magnitude beyond that. So I'm not quite sure where you got your numbers. I, I did when I when I gave that estimate, I did mention that it was extremely conservative on the high side, and there was a lot of ways to save beyond that. So that, uh, it's totally fair. We could end up using half that equally. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we'll then. I think we'll leave. Then we'll leave this as it is. And I think you you can you can sue the town if we undermine your business and while this condition reinforces that the board is serious about that provision in the bylaw that we want to we want to encourage businesses like yours to operate in town but we have energy efficiency and water efficiency and noise issues that we're trying to manage yep understood can I just clarify if who is it who does who bears the responsibility of calculating this and, and doing the study? Um, is that on would that be on our, our side of things or would that be a town function? So I would think that you would know your average annual electricity use on site because you're spending that money. So this condition requires you to be able to document what your average annual electricity use is. I think in, in, in practice, if they had a couple of solar arrays up there, that probably would never be questioned. Okay. So if we do like a, a light deprivation type top greenhouse that, you know, when we renovate it, that can be built into it. That would be part of it. But you're saying if we add additional solar on the site, that would be helpful for this in the future. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to hold your feet to the fire on it. There's an yeah. exact number. Okay. Yeah. You know, we're looking at the spirit of it rather than. Right. Understood. If it's if it's obviously they're, they're derelict, then. Yeah. That's okay. up to you. But I don't have a feeling you're going to be. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. I have to believe that, again, some of the spirit of putting this into the bylaw is to make sure that an operation in town is not drawing so much electricity that, you know, it's causing brownouts or other issues in the neighborhood for the abutters or things like that. That's weird. Okay. All right. So moving off from solar, from, from energy efficiency to odor control, we've just put in this condition that we've now used in the past. It says in the event of complaint, in the event of complaints of excessive offensive odor, the planning board shall have the ability to require additional mitigating conditions as economically practicable be undertaken at the applicant's expense. A 
Chris, Neil? So I think I just want to make, I think we talked a little bit about this and I think we've got some, some neighbors that have, um, they seem to be operating in good faith, but I just want to make sure that they're reasonable complaints and they're real. And again, I think Mark Byers on the last call said, you know, there, there could be some odor. Is it going to be offensive? Is it more offensive than other smells like cow manure and other things that, that are around the area? I just want to make sure that we're not put in a position where our, our operations are in jeopardy because someone doesn't like the project and they're going to make a big deal about odor um, just to do it. That's my only concern with it. Um, I think, it, I think I would, you, re you reach a point where with this where if it's, if it is excessive, um, you'd have to bring in and do some testing and using industry standards as to what yeah. defines excessive as okay. opposed to arbitrary smell, smell count. Okay. okay. I think if we add it in the event of reasonable complaints, that would help a lot. Yeah, because again, I don't, if we'd have to spend money on something where it turns out to be, it was a not a reasonable complaint, that's a little frustrating to deal with. And right. We just want to make sure we can operate um, as, as a, a normal business with the potential for some some odor. Now, if it's absurdly ridiculous we we understand that we we don't want that and we we're going to do everything we can to prevent that but i just want to make sure it's reasonable and we're not going to be held to a standard that's um, unreasonable let me just try another bit of wording on for size and see what people feel about this in the event of fair and reasonable complaints good yeah, I like that. can't hurt <laughs> yeah because if you've got somebody that's calling the police every third day or something about it. That sounds like somebody with a chip on their shoulder. But that's, that's a, that's a reason, that's not a reasonable complaint. I, I'm not sure fair, I mean, it doesn't matter one way or the other, but I'm not sure fair adds anything. I think that at some point, it's gonna, if this does occur, there's gonna to have to be a certain amount of arbitration to understand whether, how, whether you move forward or not. I think fair uh, leads to more problems than it solves. Yeah, I agree. I mean, what, what does fair mean? I mean okay. <laughs> How easy go? What's your feeling unreasonable, Judy? That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> Just a All reminder, right. except for outdoor cultivation, the bylaw says there will be no odors or noise deem uh, detectable at the property line. Yeah. So that's gonna be our starting place and that for the indoor cultivation, which is- No, this, this, this is saying that we can do something about it, Sarah. Right. Yeah. So, but yeah, that would be at, yes, we would definitely be calling in an arbitrator or someone, some sort of- uh, Not involved person. Yeah, this is the provision we Outside. don't have in, this, in the marijuana bylaw that we put in the solar bylaw. Right. Yep. Yeah, so, so the guy that was here last meeting, um, you know, he's so sure that this is going to work that we may just be worrying about nothing. Yeah. Good point. Which is okay. good news. So it sounds like that's it. Now there is another one that Mary noted that I think Sarah brought up based on one of the letters that we got from an abutter. This had to do with water efficiency. Had to do with what? Water efficiency. So Mary earlier today sent around an email saying that her notes she talked about the planning plan, revised energy plan with solar, which we talked about revised water usage plan to include a description of the water recirculation system. Sarah, do you, do you have a memory of that? I think you were. <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, a whole month ago. Um, it seemed to me the letter, one of the long butter letters. Um, right, they were very. To concerns about water use. And we pretty much covered this at the last meeting. Yeah. Because the, the system that they're going to use is going to use 
very little town yes. water. Yes. Is there any need, since it was just noted by Mary, does that mean, are, do we need to add a condition or are we good with the conditions as shown here? I'm Thank good with the conditions as shown. Excuse me, could I just comment on that a bit? Please. Um, I think what we were looking for was an adjustment to what we had already received about that. But, <clears throat> and I think Sophia sent updated versions of those two documents. Correct. Yep. I would like to access them on my screen, but I'm not knowledgeable enough to know how to get into it when I have the shared screen up. I don't seem to have access to <laughs> anything that's like my email. Um, but I think right after, very soon after the meeting, Sophia sent an updated thing on the energy usage and also I believe something about the water in response to having been asked to do that. I remember telling her that uh, I needed to have two documents, one the before and one the after. So I, I believe she sent us an updated document pertaining to both of those. I just can't see it right now. All right, I've got a can of select energy plan dated 3-1 and a can of select water usage plan dated 3-1. So I think those are the, the two you were talking about. So you have it? I have them, yes. Well, we have them. They're up on the... In, uh, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they're on the OneDrive. Then that, then that condition's already been taken care of. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. I, I'd like to suggest that you put in, include a condition that says that town water will, be not used, will not be used for cultivation just as a flag to, in case in case someday you know 10 years from now there are new there's a new planning board or there's new um, owners or something I, I believe that's entirely consistent with the plan and I don't think it changes anything but it's just um, important is is that? Well, LaSalle is using town, is LaSalle using town water at present? No. No. Not for cultivation. Not for cultivation. Correct. I see. You're, you guys are talking about putting in some more well points, right? No. You're going to use the existing well points yeah, I that... Uh, I don't think we have a need to. Um, I think okay. In shape. Yep. I think they intend to keep the entirely what what's being done now and, and so where is that water coming from if it's not town water but I uh, groundwater shallow wells okay thank you okay yep. but no new points are going in okay correct thank you all right so i've added that to the list of conditions chris neil yeah i think it's fine by me yeah me too Okay. Can we put if feasible? Just saying. I, I just I lock ourselves into something. I just, is it, I don't think we're going to need it, but is it? This is, may be something where we would lock you into. Okay. I just wanted to clarify. I just didn't know. Neil, are you okay with that? I knew, You know more about that than I do. I think we should be fine, but I, I that was just hesitant to take a hard line on that one. I don't know. Talking about the water? It's like one of those things that, um, uh, you know, you hope, you hope you never have to use a fire extinguisher, but it's nice to have it. it this, this, while it's well, I don't think it's ever been dry, run dry. Um, to at least have some, uh, a backup system would be. Would we be put nice. like, except for emergency use or something along those lines? No, I think the point is that in order to do that, you really need to talk to the to the water department and get their permission. Okay. okay. I don't think it's gonna be a big deal. I just like to have protection. Um, because the bylaw requires that. Okay. And you didn't go through that step because you're not planning to use it. Okay. 
but at, at this point we're using town water for residential purposes so we do have a minimal amount of water that we are using. No, I understand that. That's, that's yeah. why I put it for the cultivation. Okay, yeah. understood. Well, what, what we could do is um, change that to unless approved by the town water department. Well, yeah, good luck. Okay. Thank you. So if you need it for, you know, one replenishment, because you guys recycle 90% of this, right? Yeah, that, that's right. The chances of us actually needing it are very, very low. It would be if we, if the well ran dry during a change of the, the system, if we needed to flush it or whatever, it, it's just, it would be very low that we would have probability that we would have need for it. Plus, um, we'll probably have at least one water tank on site to store some water for, you know, just in case we need it, you know, kind of a thing that we would get out of the well anyway. So we would have a backup tank. Probably. So, again, very, very, very unlikely. We need water. Yeah, so this gives you an out, and all you have to do is call Wayne and say, listen, we need a thousand gallons. Is that a problem? Okay. He'll say yes or no. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That's perfect. Okay. All right. The rest of the board agree with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Do we have a motion to approve these conditions i will so move somebody else should second. second i will second all right we're moving all now right. <laughs> all right do a, no further discussion do a roll call vote don yes brant yes um tom yes sarah yes and judy is recused all right, I will update the file name in the OneDrive to say final or approved in the file name, and then whoever needs to distribute it. Well, I will use out. it to attach to the uh, to the permit, to the application, uh, the site plan application. So okay. uh, when I approve that. Very good. All right. Um, anything else? No, oh, thank you guys very much. Really thank you guys. Here. Yeah, we really appreciate you guys very much. Uh, it's been a, it's been a, a, a nice walk, a, a little bit of a long walk, but we were sure that we would get there with you guys. And we uh, really appreciate you uh, sitting with us through that whole process. Very right. much. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> thank you. We're eager to get it moving forward here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, discussion of potential zoning law bylaw changes. Thank you again. That would be Judy. Bylaw changes, huh? Yep. Can Judy share screen or should I share the screen of the, the R2 document? I can't share a screen, so. Okay, so I'll do this. Uh, and I hate to tell you, there's no place that can be high enough to look down on the library like that. <laughs> yeah, well, this is drones. Drones are our friends. Oh, so, all right. All right, share screen. Uh, and it was preliminary proposed. All right. Very good. So everybody should be able to see. This is the, the version two document, Judy, that you sent around. Okay. Can you show it so you can show the changes? I'm doing that right now. With that. Thank you. And four is right. So you can take out the question mark. Okay. So this was, this, this is pretty straightforward. We're requesting digital files and adding the Ag Commission. Right. 
Okay. Okay, with everybody? Yep. That looks good to me. Uh, downstairs to mom and did with my cell and uh, I thought there was that who's that speaking? Sorry. Somebody was speaking, but I don't know who that was. I don't. Okay, so we can go down to the right. marijuana. Two things we wanted to do here is to correct the indoor cultivation definition and to get the same kind of ability to monitor and correct once the facility is operating that we have in, in the solar bylaw. I mean, it's, we probably have the capacity, but it's not 100% clear. So we discovered that there was no definition of indoor marijuana cultivation. So I propose adding the wording that's here, growing a marijuana inside any greenhouse or other fully enclosed structure for the final six weeks of the marijuana plant growing cycle and any subsequent drying of these plants in these facilities. Greenhouse is a defined term in the marijuana bylaw. And I can't find it at the moment. Um, and I picked the final six weeks seems to be a generous interpretation of the more odiferous part of the of the growing cycle. I wanted to avoid the it appears that we do, several people have had nursery cultivation in greenhouses, and I don't think that that we. Should, Maybe that doesn't matter. If I don't know whether we need the qualification or not, because if, if they're not, if there's no odor in the plant cycle, maybe it doesn't matter. The only two, the two places where indoor cultivation matters in our bylaw is for odor control and for lot coverage, because. Um, the greenhouses, the greenhouses are subject to lot coverage, and I don't think there's any other place in the bylaw where it it specifies. So I have the same question that I had last time, and I've looked again at the bylaw. So, will you show? Will you point me, Judy, to where in the bylaw? the term indoor marijuana cultivation is used. Like for example, for the, in the noise and odors paragraph, I don't actually see that phrase used. It's actually in the, in the um, table of use. That's right. So that just determines whether a permit is needed. So let's look at that page in the table of use. Well, that, that says the types of operation that are allowed. So there is on page seven of the bylaws document, there is a line for indoor marijuana cultivator, not indoor marijuana cultivation. So again, I'm trying to understand what you're trying, what the what you're trying to accomplish with this definition. I think that what you're trying to do is rewrite the um, the portion of the bylaw that speaks to noise and odors. But unfortunately, and you, but unfortunately, the as written, the bylaw does not use the phrase indoor marijuana cultivation. It uses the phrase except for outdoor cultivation. So if you, if you want to 
try to apply the rules of indoor cultivation, which is, I think, what you're trying to do here. You want to say that right. all the rules that apply to indoor cultivation apply to marijuana that's grown not only inside greenhouses, which it already applies to, but these other fully enclosed structures. I think that's your intent, Judy, but you're not going to accomplish it this way because the term indoor marijuana cultivation is not used anywhere in the bylaw. Well, except that when somebody applies for a site pl for, for a permit for site plan review, they have to specify whether they're applying for indoor cultivation or outdoor, because that determines where, where they can be. Yes, so that's in their table of use. Let me finish, please. Yep. So, so if they are applying for indoor cultivation, then they are then they would be subject to, to the uh, provisions for indoor cultivation. If they are applying for outdoor cultivation, then the provisions for outdoor cultivation apply. We were told that DMTC could not be indoor cultivation because we had not defined it. So they were permitted for outdoor cultivation. So what this does, Brent, is this closes the loophole that they we, we can now call indoor marijuana cultivation, including in greenhouses, which we couldn't before. We weren't allowed by town council to apply that odor provision to them because they were not approved for indoor cultivation by the ZBA. And the CBA did not approve it because we didn't have a definition of indoor cultivation. So let me just ask this other question. I'm still not quite sure, but we also don't define outdoor marijuana cultivation. So you feel like we don't need to define outdoor marijuana cultivation if we're also going to define indoor marijuana cultivation? This makes outdoor cultivation that's done in a greenhouse, indoor cultivation. <laughs> but it's just, it's very obscure. No, it's, it, it covers our loophole. The planning board or the ZBA said that if it's not in an enclosed building, if it's in a greenhouse, that's outdoors. So we're now saying if it's in a greenhouse, it's indoor. Follow? I, I'm following that. That's the only reason this is in here. I think the reason is because if, if you want a reason, I mean, it never crossed our minds that you would need a definition of either indoor or outdoor. But the state, for purposes of dealing with electricity usage, has defined outdoor cultivation to be anything that doesn't use grow lights. So in order to distinguish ourselves from, from that, we are trying to say that anything that is grown inside something, whether, whether it uses grow lights or not, is, um, is indoor cultivation. Yeah, maybe it's my, what I'm objecting to, or maybe objection, objecting is too strong a word, that um, the, between this definition and the current right, the current writing of the noise and odors provision in the bylaw. Seems like what you're trying to do here is say, well, this is what indoor marijuana cultiv cultivation is. And the bylaw doesn't directly and clearly address indoor marijuana cultivation. So I guess what I would expect in clear would writing. Would you feel better if town council approves this? 
I th- yes, I think that would be helpful. I just find that this is very, to me, this is very opaque. That you have to, we see a definition of a term that is not used in the bylaw. My, my understanding of the way bylaws are written is you define terms that are used explicitly in the bylaws and you don't define terms that are not used explicitly in the bylaws because why not we why don't we add a definition of subterranean marijuana cultivation or aerial cultivation because we don't need to define those terms because they're not used so i town town council reviews all of this before it goes to to town meeting so Mm -hmm. so if if he sees a problem then he'll let us know So I think town council needs to understand what the intent or what we believe is the planning board adding this definition will do in terms of the noise and odors provision. Town council opined on this before. He's, he's well aware of the issue. Okay. Well, I'll stand down at this point if this is what... Um, if town council is going to approve this and we're going to have this, this is the way that it's going to be worded then. You know, consensus doesn't mean unanimity. So I'm happy to just accept this and move on. Well, we could ask. Well, why, don't we take, why don't we take a straw, a straw poll here? I think it's a good thing to have because we're not going to be blindsided again. Let's have thumbs up if you think it's a good idea. And again, what are we, the thumbs up is this definition or basically this set of changes, the new definition B and the inspections and monitoring provision. Brad, really let, me, let, me, let me understand. Does your concern would be satisfied by including two definitions, one of indoor and one of outdoor? Would that... I, I think my, the way I would state my concern is that what we're trying to do, it, that in some sense, the right way to do this is to not only define indoor marijuana cultivation, but also revise the noise and odors provision. Grant, we're really trying to help the ZBA interpret the table of use. Is that it? I thought I, it's I so five. we can change the what the noise and odors provision applies to. I think you're trying to say that um, growing marijuana in an enclosed structure is indoor cultivation now by definition. And thus um, they're required to um, mitigate odors in the way that's appropriate for indoor cultivation. Well, thus the ZBA is required to approve them for indoor cultivation. And once they are approved for indoor cultivation, then you apply the bylaws for, you can't apply for out, the outdoor provision. All okay, right. moving on. Yeah, let's move on. I think I'm gonna just withdraw this because it feels like, I think I've stated my concerns. I think there's enough, um, depth of experience here that if others don't share those concerns and understand this clearly better than I do, then I'm happy to stand down. Okay, number D. The, um, I think this is essentially the same wording that we had for the solar bylaw with the extent with the exception that I've used the words marijuana cultivation, exterior odor control and measurement. Um, 
I put stormwater management. That was, I think, in the in the solar bylaw. But I think it, there's a possibility if we get massive greenhouses, there may be water runoff. But I don't think you can add too many expertise for something like this. But perhaps you can. So I. I it's pretty straightforward. So a question, what bounds our, is it like we had that prior conversation that like we can't simply decide we're going to put an arbitrary amount of cost on these applicants by, you know, we get to hire the inspector, it's all at their cost. So again, what what is the check and balance to make sure we're doing this fairly? If they're doing something that's sketchy, they have to bear the cost to prove it's not sketchy. Yeah. Because we're not a vindictive board, and right. I can't imagine any volunteer board that would turn out to be such. Right. But then I'm not from Deerfield. It's a public <laughs> process. They can appeal to the select board. Okay. Because I certainly see, from our point of view, this is, a, this is wonderfully worded. We can require arbitrary inspections at arbitrary times and, and all of that. Um, so it works, it, we're definitely protecting the town's interests with this, but I'm sure we're not going to do it that way. You know, it's funny, Britt, you seem to be worrying that we have too much power. And I think those of us who've been on the board for a while think we don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> world. Well, I think I'm just doing what you originally, I mean, I remember you telling me that our, it seemed like our job was to balance the town's interests against interest in economic development and just sort of, it's a trade-off. So I'm maybe just arguing, just well, making sure I understand the trade-off. Balancing the town's interest and economic yeah. development interest against the abutters. Oh, it's, there's too many things to balance. Yeah. I don't think, as a practical matter, Brian Domina calls us in and says, what are you doing? Or, you know, these, these guys know how to complain. <laughs> Fair enough. I think in a lot of times with all of these, they come with all their engineers and lawyers, and here are we amateurs, right? I think we've never hired anybody except for for this for the subdivision regs, have we, Don? I think we did one for uh, the Bayer thing when it was going through. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I think we used white for that as well. All right. All right. Uh, I'm. I don't see anything wrong with that. Um. How about the accessory apartment? No. Excuse oh, me. sorry. I, I stopped sharing too soon. Yeah, what are your um, concerns, Judy? Or well, what additional information? Well, I don't know if you got the email, but um, there was, I happened to notice somehow a legal ad in the paper for CONCOM for uh, accessory dwelling unit to be built on Westbrook Road. I'm back couple months ago. And so I emailed Scott Jackson and I said, they can't build an accessory dwelling unit on on a property. It, it can, you can't have an accessory apartment in a new structure. And he emailed me back and he said, Judy, this was already permitted. Um, CBA approved it in August. It's just, we're, we're sort of back permitting the the wetlands because they didn't do it right, or he said it more politely than that. But they were they were issuing a permit after the fact, after the building had been built. So I looked up the minutes and of of the CBA meeting, and the CBA actually did talk about the, the existing provision is that you can only 
you can have an accessory apartment in a barn or a, a garage or an existing outbuilding, but it has to be exist, existing. And I know in a couple of instances people have proposed building new ones, and I think in, in at least one instance the planning board told told the ZBA we thought it was appropriate. I think it was a garage with an apartment on top, or we didn't have a problem with it. Um, Judy? Yeah? It actually was, they wanted to build a far barn so that they could use it to make an accessory apartment. And okay. we told them, okay. And um, the, the feeling was that we don't have enough affordable apartments in Waitley, and any way that we can do it and make it legal is good for the town. That was the discussion at the time. Yep. So when we first did it, and uh, this I think was before, when we wrote the accessory apartment bylaw, I think this was before Don was on the board. Yes. We, we did it specifically to get across this idea of you could use an accessory structure because you could already do it in the, in the main house, but we wanted to tell people, hey, you could also use that space in the loft of your barn or something. And for the reason that, that Don said, for more affordable housing and also, I think, for a way for people to have income. A lot of single older people living in bigger houses and um, with unfixed incomes. So, and we talked about it, and the reason we put a pre-existing structure when we first drafted it was because we were a little worried about having two houses on a lot crop up all over town. And, and so we thought, well, we'll just keep it to the existing structure. And then when, when some reasonable structure comes up that's proposed to be new, well, I think our, our thought process changed. But we still have this bylaw that says pre-existing single fam, uh, pre-existing pre accessory structure. And it's obviously not doing any good if the CBA <coughs> doesn't think we mean it, and we told them we didn't mean it. And now it turns out that there's this company called ADUs, I think, back, Backyard ADUs. And they are the ones who sold the, the people the, the structure on Westbrook Road. They, they have on their website um, a page that talks about what existing towns bylaws say about accessory dwelling units. The top item on the page is Waitley. And it says, well, the bylaw said you can't do it, but we got one permitted, and um, which they did. And it turns out Nicholas, I was chatting with Nicholas about this, and he, he looked them up, and, and their salesperson lives on Weber Road, I guess, or, or somebody involved with with marketing. So maybe there's a connection there. But anyway, it seems like we've got a problem. It says pre-existing. ZBA isn't enforcing it. I, we, we don't entirely mean it. Um, but as I was talking with Nicholas, and we were talking about this idea that we we're really worried that you, you really don't want, you want affordable housing, and you want, you know, maybe an in-law apartment or something like that don't want really big accessory units and 800 square feet of, in a new building is, is pretty big. Um, so, so I thought if we're gonna permit it in a new building, we ought to limit the size smaller than the, than the 800 square feet that had been in the original bylaw. That's subjective, but Nicholas and I talked about it for a while. 
the ADUs do come in in um, 600 square feet. That's about the smallest they do in their business. So you know, my cottage down at the Cape is 680 square feet, and that's that's pretty substantial. <laughs> I mean, it's not huge, obviously, but but it's not really what you think of as a. But yeah, I guess we just. It seems to me maybe we want to put a size limit on the if we're going to formally come out and say you can do new one. That's all. Um, so if you had a family of four that wanted to move into an accessory apartment, or, or do you, are you assuming only that this is going to be for older couples? Or well, I think an accessory apartment, by definition, is is a is a smaller thing. Um, it's usually think of it as something like an in-law apartment. Well, I'm in an in-law apartment. It's 900 square feet. And I do ramble around in it a little bit, but. <laughs> well. It shouldn't be larger than the main structure. It shouldn't be larger than the house. It's. <laughs> it's accessory. It's not the main house. Right. I don't have a particular problem with 600, but that does, I mean, if you have somebody that needs a little more than that, I don't know, I guess you could get a variance. Well, I, it's got a lot to do with, well. Affordability. Mm -hmm. I think this is why you have public hearings. Yeah. Good idea. And and also, you know, start maybe talk to the housing committee or something. But I or you know, you want to encourage affordable housing and yet you don't want to really wind up with two single family houses on a lot. Right. Not Absolutely. The so there's a compromise there somewhere. So um, are we going to take out the structure being in place for five years? Well, you if you're going to have two different sizes, I added the structure has been in place for at least five years. If, if in fact, you are going to allow okay, bigger size I... in an existing <clears throat> building where you're not creating more footprint on the land, um, then you need to have some sort of date limit that it, it has to have been there for a while because otherwise gotcha. you're right back in the same yep. pickle. Okay, I, I didn't read the rest of it that, that it should be occupied by no more than two people. So I withdraw my earlier objection. Mm -hmm. So the intent here is to allow these fully detached ADUs, but limit them in size. Yes. And at present, fully detached ADUs are not permissible under the bylaw, but we've had one example where the ZBA permitted one. We've had several, I think. They referred to a previous one. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, and that that thing on Weber Road or on uh, the Lower Road uh, was actually approved five or six years ago, and then it's because it for a guy in a wheelchair, and they did, decided not to build it, so they had to go back for a new permit. Mm -hmm. All right, I think I'm okay with this. Anybody else? I'm good. Moving on. I lost my agenda. 
Appointment of Representative to Resource Replacement Fee Working Group. Tom says he doesn't have the time. I've already beat Brent into accepting one. So it's, uh, and Judy's in more than enough committees between me and Sarah. If you won't guarantee, if you won't um, volunteer, Sarah, I'll do it. Um, how long and how much of a commitment? Because I am pretty stretched right now. And how UMass is in my job, I don't see that um, having <laughs> any better. Any less. I, I think what? actually, um, I don't mind doing this. If I'll, I'll, I'll ask for a quid some other time, but I've. I know probably more about APRs and conservation restrictions than anybody else on the board, except Tom, maybe. I accidentally ended, well, it wasn't accidental. I ended up attending the last Ag Committee meeting and they were, <laughs> so I had to explain this and I don't think I explained it very well. So um, their interpretation, they're like, oh, maybe we can get it so this money will come back and go towards APRs. And I'm like, I think it's more about reconstructing the land. So now I may have completely sent Ag Commission off on the wrong attitude anyway. No, it does really go to APRs. It goes to the- Oh, good. EAO they were very excited about that. Yeah. Oh, good. Correct them and sorry. Okay. See, I definitely shouldn't be on this. <laughs> oh my God. Well, if you can't make a Judy a meeting, Judy, you can. I, I will be alternate. Okay, fine. Anything else? We have a special meeting to do minutes sometime. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a really good idea. How about in a couple of weeks on a Tuesday night? Good. Mary, could you be ready on a couple of weeks? Uh, I thought I'd be ready already, but <laughs> I know I could be ready by the end of the month, but they, in the middle of tomorrow meetings. <laughs> the end of April or the end of March? <laughs> well, we have four to approve now. And if you can get us maybe one or two more in two weeks. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. That would cut the volume of them down. Yes. And we could start a meeting at 5.30 or something, so it would be easier for you to get there. Yeah, 5 o'clock is tough for me. But I know everybody else loves us, so I have, I've been dealing with it. But. Well, we fill you in. <laughs> Speaking of filling in, when did tonight's meeting start? I got clocked in at 5.01, but it sounded like. I let Keith in and, uh, oh, the Eversource guy, I let them in at 5.07. But Dawn started the meeting, I think, at 7.01. 5.02. Oh, I, okay, so 5. 5.02. 502 and my clock said 503 when I joined so I guess I didn't miss much um so who who was from Eversource I got a bunch of cryptic names and initials off <laughs> some of them do you do you have Keith's email we could you could email Keith and he could give you the name I think his name was Coke or Croker oh, or... that's him yeah I, well yeah. someone was done Rob, as... Rob Croker yeah C R O K E B P. So he's Eversource? He was Eversource. Okay. Uh, the only other thing I have to mention is that I am not hooked up with Dropbox yet. And right. I know, uh, Brant, you said you were going to be sending this stuff to there. Yeah. Uh, could you at least give me a, 
a crutch of another sending of an email for the yeah, well, why don't we <laughs> why don't we set up a time where we can just zoom together and I could walk you through that this. sounds it'd, good it'd be a lot easier than you trying to do this on your own and I can control your screen via zoom and make it all happen for you that's good but I I I would appreciate an email on the stuff that we discussed tonight. You know, those two things that you were filling out all the, all the details and everybody voted on it. Yeah. There's at least one thing. Was there a second thing? The conditions I did, but I'll send you the conditions document. Okay. I don't think I did anything else. All the stuff. Send me an email. Tell me what you need. And I'll get everything that's out of there and email it to you. Yeah, I was talking about all the stuff that Branch just filled out. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, he'll put it in there, and I'll I'll go ahead and or he can email it to you, either one. It would be good, and and I will be happy to take you up on your offer, okay. Branch, <laughs> to get me on it. All right, all right. And and I'll do the same for Tom if Tom still runs into trouble. Now that we have a glowing endorsement of the OneDrive from Sarah. Very good folders, good synopsis. I made just a budget one today and dropped stuff in there. Okay. Excellent. All right, so we're not doing minutes. So I think, are we ready to move to adjourn? In the time. Are we, when are we meeting for the minutes? In two weeks, the 13th? I could do that. Yeah, I, I, the, we've got several of them, but I could certainly get some of them done. What, what works for you, Mary? Is two weeks yeah. okay? There's, there's no, there's no point in scheduling. Everything that that's together. left, I can't squ swear to. I'm doing the same thing for the ZBA too. <laughs> well, she sent us four that we haven't approved, so. Yes, yeah, the four that have, we could at least get those out of the way and by the, two weeks time, I should have another two that I could send anyway. Okay. Okay, so we'll, we'll do five or six in, on the, in two weeks from today. All right. At what time on the 13th? So what time make, can you easily make Mary and have a oh, it, 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 Just leave it at five. It doesn't matter. I've been doing five for a year now. Well, <laughs> well, five thirty is easy to do. Yeah. yeah. 5.30. Give you a oh. minute to catch your breath. Really short, okay. All right. So we're going to meet on April 13th, Tuesday at 5.30. Just for an extravaganza of minutes. Of minutes. Along those lines, we're going to have to post this because it'll be a public meeting, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It needs an agenda. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I have to reserve the Zoom because we're off our normal cycle, so I'll do that. Okay. Okay, thanks, Judy. That's going to be a very popular meeting, I'm sure. When they see the agenda, they're going to come flocking in. Oh, people, Neil Dosh will definitely be there. <laughs> I'll accept the motion to uh, adjourn. So offered. Thank you. <laughs> Blissfully. Go ahead, second. Can I second my own motion? Uh, Sarah did. <laughs> Sarah? Oh, yeah. Tom? T yes. Don, yes. Brent? Yes. Judy? Yes. The motion is, or motion carries and the meeting is adjourned. At 7 Thank you. Thank All you, right. everybody. All right. Look out for an email from me, Mary, about we'll set up a time to, yes. to Zoom on, Zoom about OneDrive. All right. Ciao for now. Wow. Good night.